The final one that we are character study that we're going to finish up the lessons from legends is it found in the book of Genesis Joseph Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ an Old Testament picture of Jesus and that is why we see living like Jesus and especially when we get to chapter 50 uh, we're going to see how he uh, was a picture of Jesus Christ. We see first of all that Joseph was faithful as a son. In the book of Genesis 37, we see first of all that he was loved by his father. When in chapter 37 we see in verse 3, well, verse, go to verse 1, and we'll see. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. And these are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers. And so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So we see, first of all, loved by his father. He loved Joseph more than all the other children, and he was the son of his old age. But the Bible also says, because he loved Joseph more than all his sons, that he made him this tunic. Dr. David Jeremiah in the study Bible noted that the Hebrew phrase for a tunic of many collars describes a robe with long sleeves and skirts rather than varied hues. Although Joseph's coat was definitely an ornamental distinctive garment, the coat was significant for its symbolism, not its beauty. Joseph would be the heir of his father. Now we know that Joseph he was a son in the older age of his father. So we think usually the heir as being the older of Joseph's brothers would be the typical heir. But because of the favoritism, because he favored his son, that he indeed was going to be the heir. And Joseph's 11 brothers, they also had coats, but their tunics were short-sleeved and short-waisted, making it easier for them to do their work. So Joseph would have been noted with that longer and the long sleeved and the longer tunic or robe that he had, or we could call a coat, than what his brothers would have been. He was loved by his father, but we see in the scriptures he was hated by his brothers. Number one, they knew that he was Jacob's favorite. But then number two, Pick up in verse 5, and what's going to happen here, then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. But when was that fulfilled? When Joseph ends up in Egypt as the second man in charge just under Pharaoh. And as he is going to be distributing the grain in Egypt and Jacob's going to say to his sons, I heard that there is grain in Egypt. So go buy the grain. And as they will come, as the brothers would come, Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. 
Joseph can see them. And as can you imagine as they're bending the knee, as they are bowing down, that dream being fulfilled. It was a declaration of what was going to happen. And so as Joseph tells that, you can imagine his brothers already, <laughs> they hate him. And that hatred grows as they hear this dream and saying, are you going to rule over us? Are you going to be in that place of authority? Of course, they're not believing that, are they? He's 17 years of age. They're older. He's a son of Jacob's older age. What, what do you think? In fact, they would say, here comes this dreamer. They would refer to Joseph. Now, verse 9, he still had another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have still had another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow your, ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. The dad kept the saying in the mind, but his brothers were jealous. They're hating him. But we see that Joseph was obedient to his call. We're told in verse 12 that his brothers were to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I am looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they're pasturing the flock. Then the man said, They have moved from here. I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan, about 20 miles away from Shechem, that they had went on and they had taken the flocks. But Joseph was obedient. As his father said, I want you to go, and you're to check on your brothers. You were to go. And so when we think about obedient to his call, Mark Rasmussen in the, the book we've been using, The Lessons from Legends, indicated one of the great lessons of Joseph's life was that he obeyed his father even when the commands could not have been comfortable or enjoyable. His father sent him to his brothers, who, as we have already learned, hated him. Joseph simply obeyed. Our Heavenly Father has sent us to evangelize a world which sometimes hates us, but it is simply our joy to obey. You know, sometimes we can run into things and we, we see people that have a completely different worldview. We are to have a biblical worldview, which basically we have glasses on and we look through a lens, don't we? I know if I take my glasses off, everything's blurry. <laughs> I need to have them. And, and I look through the lenses, and it's a reminder. We have, as we walk with the Lord, we have the aspect of looking at the Scriptures. And in fact, this is an important passage that Paul gave us. He challenges us to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. We get the word metamorphosis. The transforming, we're not transforming ourselves, we're being transformed. The renewing of our mind. A renewal of our mind that we can think biblically. That we look at our world through the lens of Scripture. You know that even affects suffering. It affects the time uh, when we have a loved one who is nearing death. We have a, a perspective, yes, we would miss them here. There is a sense that, yes, we want to hold on to them, don't we? 
And we would ask the Lord, Lord, will you heal them physically? Will you touch them and heal them? But God's desire is not always to heal the body here. Sometimes it's the ultimate healing to be the believer, to be in the presence with the Lord. And that's the, the Psalm 116 truth, that the death of a saint is precious in his sight. And so here's the, the thinking. We can face that time differently. Why? Because we understand. We understand eternity. We understand the promise of heaven. We understand that, that we have, we, and because we're viewing life biblically. But what about the one who does not believe in the Lord and they think that death is it? There are those that just think that this is this life here and when it's over, it's that, you know, we're just done. That there's no more, you know, there's no aspect of that this would be the only thing, the only time. No. So that's a worldview. How do we view the scriptures? How we view this life through the lens? And so Joseph obeyed. We must be obedient. We must see the people that have this thinking that this, you know, well, I might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because... When we die, just that's it. No, we need to proclaim the truth, don't we? We see people, whether it be a grocery store, whether it be at the restaurant, we see people that have all sorts of different, we're living in a time where people have all sorts of ideas, all sorts of different appearances, and we need to see them as people that need to be told about Jesus Christ. That is the, the idea. There's a mission field. Obedience. So we see that Joseph was faithful. First of all, as a son. But then we're going to see that he is faithful as a servant. We remember that as Joseph goes to check on his brothers... And they see him coming. And they said, here comes that dreamer now. And remember that they sell Joseph. They sell him. And he ends up at Potiphar's house in Egypt. Potiphar gets him from the Midianite traders that were coming through. And we're told in the scriptures as he's a faithful servant, first of all, at Potiphar's house, the Bible says that Joseph had been taken down in chapter 39 and verse 1, taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him or bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. But notice in verse 2, the Lord... This is all capital letters. This is Yahweh was with Joseph. So he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Oh, this is a time he is now well away from his father. He's away from his brothers. He's been sold into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. He has been bought by Potiphar. A, a high-ranking officer there in Egypt. He's far away from home. 17 years of age. He's, he's a youth. He's 17 years old. He's been sold. And as a servant. But that phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. We see that phrase, and it's true in his life as a servant. Joseph is physically alone, but the Lord was with him, and he became a successful man. I think about the glorious promises found in Isaiah 43. 
these are tremendous promises. We may be going through a difficult time facing challenges. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. He's saying here initially in, in, in the scripture to Israel, you're mine, but we have great application as a believer. What's the Lord? I have redeemed you. You belong to me. You're mine. When you pass through the waters, we associate that with times of difficulty. I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. He is the Lord. As Jesus would tell the disciples. Jesus had been telling the disciples he was going to be leaving them. But they are now to be his witnesses. He gives them the great commission, which is still applicable today. That he is saying that they are to go as they're going, that he would... They are to go and make the disciples of all the nations. But that glorious promise, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There are still missionaries serving around the world. Every once in a while I hear Dr. Michael Youssef, he talks about kingdom stat, talks about the ministries reaching in the Middle East. Dr. Youssef grew up in the Middle East, and he has a burden to see people in the Middle East to be saved. And you know what? Gospel programming is going forth. There's programming, you know, it's amazing, but they're using whether it be cell phones and various ways to get the Word of God out all around the world. And you know, as we see that proclamation, even where missionaries are not able to get in, the closed nations, the Word of God is still getting through. And people are being saved. And the Lord says, I will be with you even to the end of this age. Again, Dr. Jeremiah mentioned fellowship with the Lord means freedom from fear and loneliness. Fellowship with the Lord, partnership, true koinonia, a oneness with the Lord. That as we are walking with him, even though Joseph was physically alone, what a great assurance that the Lord was with him. And you see that over and over in these chapters. The Lord was with Joseph. You see that again when he ends up in the prison. He becomes Potiphar's personal servant. The master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph, in verse 4 we see in chapter 39, so Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. So the Lord is with him. And even though he's now in a strange land, he is serving this Potiphar. He's his personal servant and the Lord is blessing him. And Potiphar recognizes it. Isn't it amazing when people recognize the hand of the Lord and how he's working and the blessing? That's what Potiphar, throughout Joseph's life as a servant, 
Others, they recognize, and they'll say, the Lord is with him, and he is prospering him. He is a successful man as he is serving. So he's faithful as a servant to Potiphar. We see the last part of verse 6. There's a note that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withhold nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. But here is the great question. This is the question that Joseph asked beforehand, but David later on wouldn't ask or didn't ask. Here is the great question. He said, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Here's Joseph's great question. This would be a sin against Almighty God. How can I do this evil and sin against God? Now David didn't ask that question with Bathsheba, did he? Now after the fact, in Psalm 51, he said, against you and you only have I sinned. He recognized that he had sinned against God, but Joseph asked it beforehand and prevented him from doing any evil in the sight of God. So Joseph was faithful in Potiphar's house. But we remember the story when he would not lie and there was nobody around and she gets a hold of Potiphar's wife, gets a hold of his clothing and you know what he does? He does what Paul later on in 1 Corinthians would teach us and also in 2 Timothy to flee. There's times the best thing to do is get out of there. And that was, in fact, there's the command, flee immorality, flee idolatry. Idolatry and immorality are tied together in the Scriptures. And so what we see, Joseph took off, didn't he? And he left the garments in Potiphar's wife's hands. Well, she comes up with a story and, and says to those others around that, you know, accuses him of violating her. And that would lead to the next place. Where is he going to end up because of this accusation? Pharaoh's prison. So he is falsely accused. He has done nothing wrong. But guess who is still with him? The Lord. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. So we remember that he ends up in Potiphar's prison, verses 19 to 23 of this same chapter 39, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. So the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail. Notice how he ascends to these positions of leadership. So even in the prison, he is given charge over all the prisoners. So that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made him to prosper. Again, we see that phrase. <laughs> he is faithful as a servant. He is faithful in Pharaoh's prison. Well, you might remember as the dreams that happened that uh, Pharaoh would have, and there were two fellows that were prisoners that served Pharaoh. There was the chief baker and the chief, the, uh, chief cupbearer to Pharaoh that were there in prison. 
Well, they both had dreams. And so we see in the scriptures what was one of the ways that God would communicate was through the dreams. And so you see they had both had dreams and they didn't know what these dreams meant. And so because the Lord gave Joseph the ability to be able to give the interpretation of what these dreams meant. You remember what when the chief cupbearer was restored to his position, do you remember that uh, Joseph said, remember me? But what happened? He didn't. He didn't remember until Pharaoh is going to have these dreams and doesn't know what it means. And it was the prediction about the famine that was going to hit the, the land. The, the years of prosperity would be swallowed up by the, the years of famine. And so he says, wait a second, I remember there was a man there in the prison. When you were upset with us and we were there, he was able to tell us the dreams. Now the Egyptians were not like the Jews because the Egyptians were clean shaven. So remember, Joseph goes before Pharaoh clean shaven and Pharaoh tells him and he's able to tell him what the meaning of those dreams means, what it means. And Pharaoh says, wait a second, who is so wise as you are? Again, what did Pharaoh recognize about Joseph? But the Lord was with him and the Lord was causing him to prosper and the Lord was working through him as a faithful servant. So in chapter 41, verses 38 to 44, the Bible says, Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and according to your command, all my people shall do homage only in the throne that will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in a second chariot and they proclaimed before him, Bow on the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. In verse 46, now Joseph was 30 years old. So remember, he was 17 years old when he goes out to check on his brothers. He was 17 years old when he sold into slavery. So now... It's been those 13 years. What was the Lord doing? Did he face a lot of trials? Yes. He was not in the familiar. All these were new things. But from age 17 to age 30, the Lord was working on Joseph. Because he knew what Joseph was going to be. He was going to be an awesome responsibility over Egypt. Just second in command to Pharaoh. And the Bible says that so when he's 30 years, he stood before Pharaoh and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. He said, here, this is what we need to do. So we'll have enough for the years of famine is that we will store up the grain. They'll store up and add enough to sell to the other nations. That's why Jacob's going to say to the, his sons, I've heard there's, there's grain in Egypt. Go there and buy us grain so that we may live. This was a widespread famine. And so he faithfully served the people of Egypt. 
Finally, we see about Joseph, he was faithful as a sovereign. Well, we know that a Joseph will eventually reveal his identity to his brothers. Isn't that amazing? Joseph knows them, of course, but they don't recognize him. They started believing, even though they knew it was a lie, that the wild animals hadn't, you know, hadn't killed him as they would take the, the, the coat or the tunic that the father had made. And as they would dip it in, in blood and then as they would tread it, so make it like a wild beast has devoured him. But they had no idea that he had ascended in power in Egypt as they came before him. Can you imagine as they are bowing down before him that, wait a second, that dream that the Lord gave and that's happening. And then they, and Jacob says, we're, we're out of the grain, go back and, and buy. And he says, we, we can't go back unless we would take Benjamin, the younger, and Joseph's younger full brother to go back. And he said, I'm already grieved of my son Joseph and you're gonna cause grief upon grief. And then, can you imagine that glorious news? As Jacob hears, wait a second, Joseph's alive and he is a sovereign in the land of Egypt. And he is calling, he kept asking us about your welfare, about how you were doing. And then Jacob is gonna go and he's gonna see Joseph. Oh, but before that, when Benjamin gets there, remember what happened? Oh, they're, they're weeping. When, and that, at that point in time, has Joseph had everybody go out and he disclosed his identity to the brothers. We talk about a picture of Jesus Christ in chapter 50. Verses 15 to 21, first of all, a forgiving sovereign. Joseph had the authority, he had the power to seek the revenge upon his brothers. We see in chapter 50, in beginning of verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong and now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for am I in God's place? Paul would teach that in the book of Romans, wouldn't he? Don't seek revenge. Why? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord of hosts. I will repay. So Joseph didn't seek the revenge, did he? The brothers are concerned. Now he's going to really get us because our father, he waited till our father was dead. But no, he was forgiving. But notice verses 20 and 21, he was a saving sovereign here. As for you, you meant evil against me. You intended evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. I, that's an Old Testament version of Romans 8, 28. 
And we know that God causes all things to work out together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Joseph understood, and that was a Romans 8, 28 moment in the book of Genesis in chapter 50. You intended evil against me, but God has used it for good to preserve life. Because that was not wisdom that generated from Joseph himself, but God gave Joseph the wisdom, the ability to administer all this in Egypt. And he used it to preserve the life and the life of his own family. So therefore, he said, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them, them and spoke kindly to them. So see how Joseph, he realized that God had put him into a position to save his family and his people. And he decided that he would accept this responsibility with personal passion and fervent diligence. Mark Rasmussen, Mark Rasmussen wrote in Lessons from Legends. So we think about Joseph. You know, I was thinking about this. Jesus' brothers, remember, wouldn't believe in him. Joseph's brothers despised him. You have, uh, the, the Bible's not presenting Joseph isn't sinless, but you have an Old Testament picture of Jesus with Joseph. But also we think about how he did not yield to temptation and sin. But he said, how can I do this evil and sin against God? But you have the grace demonstrated to his brothers. And that he said, you intended this evil, but God has meant it for good. That he demonstrated forgiveness. So we think about the conclusion. As we think about the conclusion with Joseph. Faithfulness. If one word would be used to describe the life of Joseph, it would without a doubt be the word faithfulness. In every situation into which he was plunged, thrown or placed, Joseph was completely faithful. He was dedicated to his cause and to his testimony and the testimony of God. How dedicated are you? How faithful are you to the name of the Lord and to the calling and responsibility he has placed in your life? Perhaps it's time you allowed yourself to accept the truths of the life of Joseph as if you had never heard them before. Do not be afraid to let them affect you. Do not be afraid to let the truths of God's word change who you are. And do not be afraid to stand up and live for Christ. That's a good challenge Mark Rasmussen gave in Lessons from Legends. As we think about powerful principles from the life of Joseph. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, as we have been looking at a survey in a sense of Joseph's life recorded for us in the book of Genesis. Indeed, he was faithful as a son, he was faithful as a servant, and he was faithful as a sovereign. And a great demonstration that he didn't seek the revenge when he had opportunity. But he saw everything. He, uh, what a statement as he makes that even though his brothers intended evil for him, that you, Father, had taken it and used it for good to preserve life. And Lord, even how he tenderly took care of them and their loved ones and their children as they would be there in Egypt. But we're thankful that he said, don't leave my bones here in Egypt. When you leave, take my bones with you. And we thank you for that truth that he had a longing. And Lord, help us 
as we study this passage to apply it to our lives, to be challenged in faithfulness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.